Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you so much for being with us at uh, this inaugural event for the 2015-2016 Chancellor's Colloquium, Distinguished Speaker Series. We are, um, of course, extremely excited to have our speaker today, and you will hear about her and her um, talk. But I wanted to also remind you that um, this colloquium series was created here at UC Davis to give us the opportunity to talk, of course, about higher education, but also to talk about the rest of the world. And so we're trying to put what we do here in perspective, in a global perspective, um, because as we know, what is happening around the world now is extremely important to us as well. And it is critical that our faculty, staff, and students are exposed to speakers from not only um, uh, around the US, as we have tried very hard to do, but also from around the world. And we've been um, very lucky to have a few of our speakers to come from different countries, but different continents. And um, we are very pleased today to have with us our speaker, uh, Dr. Manfela Ranfele. And um, you're gonna hear about her, you're gonna be amazed by what she has accomplished in her life. I met her many years back when I was uh, the Dean of Engineering at Purdue and she was a Senior Vice President for the World Bank. And she was um, in charge of uh, programs de in developing countries in that particular case was a program in India or a number of programs in India and of course in um, Africa. And I became very uh, impressed by her personally. So I tried here for a number of years to get her to come. Of course, she was very busy in um, South Africa with um, a number of activities, but we were very lucky to have her this um, year. And in fact, uh, very honored to have her start the series for this year, for 2015-16. So the way we run this, um, presentations, these talks, the discussions, is to have the speaker, of course, uh, speak for a short period of time, and then we have a panel. But you will hear about the speaker and, of course, how we are going to have this uh, discussion go on today from uh, Professor David Bial, B Bill, um, the director of the uh, UC Davis Humanities Institute and the Emanuel Ringenblum Distinguished Professor of History who will introduce our speaker, and will introduce also our moderator, and then our provost, Ralph Hexter, who in fact has been very kind to be the moderator in a number of interesting presentations, and he always makes those presentations even more interesting, seriously. And I wanna thank both of them. First of all, the Institute for the Humanities for running this uh, series that uh, we have so much enjoyed and our provost as well. So Dave, I'd like to come forward. Thank you so much. Thank you and uh, welcome uh, to all of you for joining us for this conversation with Mampella Rampele. Our format this afternoon will begin with uh, opening remarks by Dr. Rampele entitled, Can South Africa Liberate Itself from Post-Apartheid Politics of Legacy Capture? followed by a discussion with our provost and exec executive vice chancellor, Ralph Hexter. Then you, the audience, will be given an opportunity to ask your own questions of Dr. Rampele. Allow me first to introduce our moderator, provost and executive vice chancellor, Ralph Hexter. Ralph Hexter is a distinguished scholar in classics and comparative literature. And as an academic leader, he has made it a priority to foster excellence across the full range of disciplines and to promote equal opportunity, diversity, and inclusion for students, faculty, and staff. I'm now honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Mampela Rampele, an active citizen in both the public and private sectors worldwide. Dr. Rampele studied medicine at the University of Natal has a BCom degree, a diploma in tropical hygiene, a diploma in public health, and a PhD in social anthropology. She went on to become vice chancellor of UCT, the University of Cape Town, where I actually had the privilege of teaching for a month while she was vice chancellor. She then went on to become one of the four managing directors of the World Bank. 
Dr. Rompele is the author of several books and publications on socioeconomic issues in South Africa. She has received numerous national and international awards, acknowledging her scholarship and leading role in spearheading projects for disadvantaged people in South Africa and elsewhere. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Rompele. I turn the podium over to you now. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me on this beautiful campus. It's also very interesting how the wheels of life turn that your chancellor is someone I met in a completely different context many moons ago. But here we are today meeting on a platform that reminds me of the importance of universities in the lives of nations. I'm going to focus my talk on liberating narratives that deal with this issue of the imprisoning capture of liberation politics. I start by boasting about my country, which remains spectacularly beautiful, with incredibly resourceful and resilient people who are determined to complete the journey to an envisaged country which is non-racial, non-sexist, and a prosperous democracy. But it is obvious to everyone who cares to look that poor governance and systemic corruption are undermining our potential for success. The ANC government, under the inspirational leadership of Nelson Mandela, was exemplary in laying the foundations of our constitutional democracy. We embrace the challenges of the past, acknowledging and confronting its ugliness and working together to build a shared vision for our country. 21 years later, we now have to acknowledge that we have fallen far short of our own goals, what went wrong, what can be done to reinvigorate the transformation impulse and get our country working again. My view is that the South African citizen, as the owner of the state, has been missing in action over the last 21 years. Too much reliance has been put on the ANC government to deliver on the promise of freedom. The fruits of freedom were enjoyed by citizens, and occasionally they look around and complain when things went wrong. But the job of civic stewardship, of shaping the future, was not done. The ANC's spectacular electoral successes, despite objective evidence of its failure to meet its own set post-apartheid uh, goals, have not led to a reduction in that success. The ANC has successfully pos positioned itself as the sole liberator of the country with the entitlement to govern. And not just to govern, to govern in perpetuity. President Zuma has said publicly that the ANC will rule until Jesus Christ comes again. <laughs> now we warn him that Jesus Christ might just hurry. <laughs> in this talk, I would like to explore three key narrative strands that keep the ANC in power. The first, the sole liberator and only guarantor of freedom from oppression. The second, strong branding of the ANC as Mandela's party. The third, the nurtured 
dependence of citizens on the ANC patronage. I will conclude with a question on all of your minds. What does the future hold for South Africa? A few indicators tell me that a reawakening is occurring among citizens, and that's what gives me hope. Citizens in many settings are determined to weave anew their own stories to enable them to assume their active roles as the shapers of their own and their country's future. It is my view that it falls on the shoulders of the younger generations to mobilize their fellow citizens to complete the transformation process into the envisaged South Africa that we dream of. So let's start with the narrative thread of Soul Liberator. The central theme of the ANC's powerful narrative is woven around the claim of soul authorship of the successful outcome of the liberation struggle. All other liberation movements and their leaders have either been appropriated by the ANC or written out of our history. The only leaders acknowledged as heroes of the struggle for liberation are ANC leaders. The Mandelas of this day, Oliver Tambo, Walter Sisulu, Ahmad Katrada, Governor Mbeki. The claim of soul liberator resonates with the lived experience of many South Africans. Many have families who have over the years been members and active participants in the ANC, and they only know the ANC as a liberation movement. So over the last 100 years, there have been direct and indirect experience of the ANC as a liberator. The ANC's performance as an exile movement achieved major successes that elevated its profile internationally. At the UN, it was regarded as the authentic voice of oppressed people. Nelson Mandela's active engagement and leadership of the process of political settlement has also secured ANC, the ANC claim of soul liberator. Acknowledgement of the critical role that the ANC played should not and does not justify the writing off of other players who contributed significantly to the achievement of our freedom. Those contributions, directly or indirectly, actually strengthened the ANC and made it a better leader of the negotiation process. Let me just give you an example of the Sharpeville massacre on the 21st of March in 1960. That was led by Robert Sobukwe. It was, in fact, the Sharpeville massacre that elevated the struggle for freedom internationally. So Bukwe's contribution to liberation has been made invisible in many ways by even the renaming of Shabville Day as Human Rights Day. The same fate has been meted out to the Black Consciousness Movement. Many of you may have noticed that the famous Long Walk to Freedom doesn't have one reference to one Stephen Bantubiko. The BZM movement mobilized young people at higher education and school level to re-energize the struggle for freedom which was in the doldrums. It was Steve Biko's analysis, and I quote, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. If one is free, at heart, no man-made chains can bind one to servitude. This remains a truism in my country. The minds of my beloved country have been sufficiently and effectively captured, this time ironically by the ANC. President Zuma disdainfully talks about citizens in this way. At a recent Youth League meeting, he said, 
and these are his words, every revolution produces its counter-revolutionaries. Who will tell them if you don't do it? Whether in social media, parliament, although you are not in parliament, but here you can wait for them when they come out of parliament. Imagine a president instigating conflicts with MPs. That's the level of entitlement. The entitlement narrative also extends to the established culture within the ANC of capturing the state. A deliberate process of blurring the lines between the party, the government, the state, justifies the ANC claim to be the provider of all benefits flowing from the provisions of public services. So that's the first narrative, the soul liberator. The second narrative is that the ANC is the party of Mandela. Nelson Mandela has been singled out correctly as a major icon of uh, the struggle for freedom. He was presented as a symbolic figure and he also acted very convincingly and inspirationally as a, a figure that people could uh, warm to and feel inspired by. Mandela the icon continues to loom large for his seminal contributions to the negotiated settlement. Not even the grave seems to be able to contain his power as an icon. It is the continued positioning of Mandela as inextricably linked to the ANC that makes him an invaluable brand asset. Millions of South African voters, black and white, continue to see the ANC as Mandela's party. Even when people are angry, they cannot bring themselves to use the power of their vote to punish the ANC because they believe by punishing the ANC, they're punishing Mandela, an unthinkable act. The ANC brand as Mandela's party is also strengthened by the persistence of poverty, unemployment, and inequality in our society, and these remain color-coded. The daily indignities of racism in our streets, in our workplaces, confirm the assertion that white people are not committed to non-racialism and socioeconomic justice. By their own admission, white business leaders have hugely benefited from the political settlement, and they've made no major sacrifices either before, during, or after the struggle. On the contrary, the Global Financial Integrity Report of 2012 shows that in that year alone, the outflow of illicit brands from South Africa amounted to 147 billion, which is $29 billion. And we as South Africa are ninth in the world in terms of these illicit flows. And when you calculate what that money could have done, you could have funded 1.9 million students in our higher education system. These illicit flows happen because of the abuse of the transfer pricing mechanism of many of South African companies that have got their headquarters in other parts of the world. This becomes grist to the mill of those in the ANC saying, we cannot provide all of what's needed because of continued apartheid and white racism. The reconciliation between black and white would be made much more difficult unless white people also come to the party and make their contribution to the building of a non-racial South Africa. The third thread which keeps people captured in the past is the dependence of citizens on the ANC government. South Africans, black and white, have no experience of democratic governance. 
the majority of citizens really don't know how to be a citizen with all the rights and the responsibilities that are set out in our constitution. That the practice of democracy is foreign to all of us. The idea of citizens as stewards of the de democracy is not part of our culture. And so citizens leave those in government to pretty much do as they like. And the ANC has deliberately neglected civic education. When I was at the World Bank, there was a great friend of mine who was running the education department there. And he said, how can we have the civic education, my pillar, that you're talking about? And I gave them copies of what different countries do. It doesn't suit them to have citizens who understand their rights and responsibilities. But if that was all, it would be one thing. In addition, the ANC has failed to educate or to create an education system that would create citizens appropriate for the 21st century. And having failed to educate our young people, not because of lack of money, but because of a philosophical orientation that's very much old school. The ANC having failed to educate and train young people has also deliberately created a culture of dependency among citizens. The pretext is that they are correcting the injustices of the past. We have social grants to 16 and a half million South Africans out of the 53 million. 11 and a half million of those are child grants. These are for all children up to the ages, the age of 18 years. Now, you would think, well, that's not a bad thing, but how much is the child grant? $23 a month. Now, what can you do with $23 a month? So what it does is to create a false sense of security. And the worst aspect of it is that the child grants are increasingly going to underage single moms who are dropouts out of our school system. So this fuels a vicious cycle of weak, poor families. But if you think the patronage system only applies to the bottom end of the pyramid, wait again. It also benefits those higher up in the power hierarchy of the ANC, starting with those at the top, president, of course, has just built himself a palace. Those in cabinets help themselves in different ways. The loyalists in the private sector get the largest of all government procurement. This patronage system has undermined professionalism in state-owned enterprises, and the problem becomes the weakening of the institutions of the state. What is puzzling to most of you as outside observers is despite all of this, come election day, the ANC will get 60% or more. But immediately after that, they'll be followed by violent protests where poor people burn what little facilities exist in their situation. Now people think, how can this happen? But we now know enough from socio, social and neurobiologists and, and neuropsychologists that there is a link between multiple traumas and acts of self-sabotage. And that's visible in my country. The ANC narrative, all combined, is aimed at keeping the past alive and projecting itself as the only guarantor of a liberated South Africa. And they exploit this multiple wounded mental condition. The ANC is, to paraphrase Steve Biko, using the most potent weapon, the mind of citizens, to keep themselves in power in perpetuity. So what does the future hold for South Africa? African citizens, not just in South Africa, all the way up, including Uncle Bob next door, 
the only thing that's going to make Africa realize its potential as the lions on the move, as McKinsey's study of 2010 said, is active citizenship. My engagement with the establishment of the citizens' movement in 2011 and then Ahang essay in 2013 was motivated by this desire to say to my fellow citizens, we can do this. Active citizens are essential to holding those in, in government accountable. And the critical question we face is how do you mobilize people? My idealism propelled me to devoting a lot of time, energy, and personal money to mobilize citizens. And I was naive to believe that when people say enough is enough, they mean it. They don't. And that was an expensive, expensive mistake. But failure is the greatest teacher. What went wrong? And what have I learned? First, I underestimated the power of the ANC narrative and the amount of time it would take to raise the level of consciousness of citizens to the point of overcoming. Second, I failed to form coalitions with the smaller parties because they too have bought into this narrative that there will always be minorities. But even within Ahang, the imprisonment of the mind was such that when we were to explore how we were to strengthen ourselves, as those of you in business know, if you don't have the um, particular attributes, you do an acquisition. The failed acquisition and merger with the DA was disastrous because it then left us with very little time to build the machinery to do what needed to be done. And that failure reflected, again, the mindset change. A lot of people in Ahang couldn't abide working with white people. And a lot of people in the DA were scared that this woman is unmanageable and she might just mess us up. They were all right. Third, I underestimated the level of resources that would take to build a sophisticated machine. The ANC juggernaut, which uses state resources, leaves nothing to chance. Food parcels, blankets, freebies of any form or shape are distributed by the Department of Social Development in full daylight. But it is the undermining of the independence of the Independent Electoral Commission that really put the final nail on the coffin of Aha. Numerous cases of just mismanagement of ballot papers, somewhere recorded on television, didn't make any difference. But one dramatic piece which I will uh, leave you with is, as the voting booth was closing, in Zanin, which is an area where I had been restricted to, and it was known as an Ahang strong, I mean stronghold. Three gunmen burst into the uh, voting booth and wanted to appropriate the five ballot boxes. Fortunately, the police who were there, who were sympathizers of Ahang, because some of them were young, men and women that I had actually looked after when I was a doctor then, they stopped it and got the boxes into the magistrate's office. They're still sitting there. No one has ever been um, charged, and those ballots were never counted. Now, that's not an excuse for not having been able to do better, but it gives you a flavor. At the heart of the failure of alternative parties is the failure of young people who are the majority across the country to come out in their numbers to vote. I had occasion to meet many of these young people, high school students, university students, dropouts, and so on, and ask them, what happened? Well, 
I didn't think that my vote mattered, said one. Others, well, I spoiled my ballot because I couldn't disobey my parents who said I should only vote for the ANC, but I couldn't bring myself to vote for them. So the potent weapon the ANC has in staying in power despite its own admission of failure is the mind of citizens of South Africa. So the intergeneration perpetuation of this notion of the ANC as the only party is something that's going to be with us for a while unless we do something about it. So the reawakening of activism within the higher education sector, some of you may have seen some of it, gives me hope that young people are at last waking up to say, we have to finish this journey of transformation. Young South Africans need to be supported to go on this journey of healing, just like we did in the late 60s, they now have to take up the struggle. This healing work is going to involve my generation that fought for freedom, supporting the generation of my sons so that we can together heal the wounds of the past which justify this capture that the ANC has over South Africa's politics. We need to have strong networks of support and healing circles. Let me conclude. I remain optimistic that my country will one day become the country of my dreams. A much more focused human consciousness raising campaign to acknowledge, express, and heal the wounds of the past would free my fellow black citizens from the inferiority complex that has reasserted itself in South Africa. We also need a consciousness raising process to free my fellow white citizens from the superiority complex that prevents them from engaging in a mutually healing process with black people. This healing process would allow the future to emerge from our ugly past. It is these possibilities that keep me hopeful. Thank you. You know, I, I must say, I, I would only dream that some of our political figures going to another country would be as frank about <laughs> some of the challenges and their own, um, their own pathway. So let me ask you, that. I have so many questions and then we'll be opening to, to everyone. I'm sure everyone has questions, but I have to ask you, and um, could you give this talk in South Africa? Absolutely. As, in fact, as we finish talking here, it will be posted on my um, Facebook in South Africa. And there will be an open discussion. And uh, in the meetings that I have with students at university, students uh, at, in high school, or ordinary men and women in different walks of life, I speak frankly about this because young people have to learn that you must not be afraid of failure. Failure is there as a teacher. You must embrace its lessons. And they can't do it if we don't model that. So for me to say, no, it's just those people who mess up. No, I messed up. Because I had never been a member of a single political party until I formed AHA. So I betrayed my own intuition that kept me away from being a member of the ANC. Mandela tried to get me to be a member of the ANC uh, in the 90s so that I could join the government. I said, I would love to help and be a member of your cabinet, but as an independent person. Of course, the ANC would not hear of that. But I, was, I felt strongly enough about it that I for, forgo the um, opportunity to work with him. But 
the desperation to which South Africa has been pushed by the ANC, incompetence, and corruption is what got me to take that desperate step. R remarkable. I mean, when I consider <clears throat> the, the discourse, um, the public discourse here of politicians, I think one rarely hears someone speak of failure and, and independence, but we'll come perhaps around to that. <clears throat> Again, you know, you've done so many different things. Your pathway is really remarkable, and I know that you know, you've kept us and we want to be at that level of systems and nations, but I have to ask you, tell us a little bit about yourself. What was the energizing force that got you on this pathway through your own education and to master so many different areas? I was fortunate to have been raised by two teachers, primary school teachers. So I, the idea of learning is a lifelong mission. And also, I grew up early on understanding that physically I have zero competence, but <laughs> I knew that there was something between my ears. And so my parents were pushing me to really reach whatever height I wanted. And I was fortunate also that when I went to high school, I found teachers who were really uh, committed to helping me reach my dreams. It was a restricted time of, of the life of my country. So I became a medical doctor because my science teacher, who was a white man, said, I'm sorry, I wanted to be a chemist. I'm sorry, you will not be able to get a career as a chemist. I advise you to do medicine. So I didn't do medicine because I wanted to help people. I did medicine because it was the only best uh, option that would allow me the independence, but also that would utilize my love for science and mathematics and so on. So I. As soon as I had the options opened, which was in the early 90s, I went to the University of Cape Town and became a researcher. And one thing leads to another, but one constant. So my, my careers look very desperate in terms of different things, but there's one common factor, the desire to get my country to become the best that it can, and for me to play an active role in that regard. So as a researcher, the job was to ask those uncomfortable questions. How can you have men grow up living in little dormitories, and you expect them to be respectable men and, and fathers and so on? So, my PhD thesis was about space. It was about, and the book was called A Bed Called Home. Now, today people wonder, why are South Africans so brutal, so violent? Hello, if you restrict somebody's mindset and you treat them with such indignity over generations, that's the multiple traumas that I was talking about. That's what happens. And so I was able then, building on that, to be able to tackle transforming UCT, where I, I wasn't an academic that went through the normal path, so it was great fun to be able to do things which were uh, taboo and raise taboo subjects. Uh, so it's, it's, as an anthropologist, I think it's very nice to be the outsider to come into such an environment. And the same thing with the World Bank. I wasn't an economist. I went to the World Bank because I was invited by Jim Wolfenson, the then president, to help him build the human development uh, seg segment of it. That's where I met your chancellor. So I believe that women who are always the other, the outsider, the marginal, they actually see a lot more of what's going on. And if they have the courage to engage, then they can do much more than men who tend to be afraid of this is not proper. And of course, I have to also admit that 
I come from a long line of very strong women. My great-grandmother, who was our child minor, my grandmothers on both sides, my mother. My mother was something else. Anyway, so that's me. Fantastic, fantastic story. And I, I have to say I agree that having that distance, being a bit of an outsider, uh, can, can really help and contribute to. So actually I wasn't, your, your, your last segment of your narrative there about um, your role and your opportunity as a woman and also some of the great female leaders in your family. Let me ask this, in, in South Africa, and all these questions, I mean, I'm certain to reveal a lot of, of ignorance. What is the role of women in politics and in the ANC? And is there a, a hope that there can be a renewal from, from that direction? Well, we have the great honor of having the foundations of a real egalitarian society in our constitution. And during our struggle for freedom, this outsider, this outrageous kind of voice was able to introduce the issue of gender right into the middle of the struggle. People said, no, 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 you're going to divide the struggle. Excuse me, I'm black, I'm woman, which part do you want to have today? So we had to look at the intricate complexities of social relationships in a society which was not only racist, sexist as well, and very, very toxic masculinity is what is the narrative in South Africa and the kind of uh, cultural um, formation which creates great difficulties. Now, today we've got a constitution that says men and women are equal. You go to parliament, you see quite uh, respectable numbers of women, about 40 something percent. You go to parliament, you, I mean, you go to the cabinet of South Africa, you see probably about 30 something percent women. And you go to many institutions, women are visible, but are they audible? Are they effective? Within the ANC, absolutely not. I mean, during that time when I was uh, 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 going around the country campaigning for AHA, ANC Youth League women were saying, South Africa is not ready for a woman president. Hello? <laughs> Did I hear that? Yeah. And now, this year, because they are preparing for the ANC's 20, uh, 2017 uh, internal elections, and the story is that Mrs. Zuma, uh, uh, who's at the AU, might be put forward as the leader of the ANC. Suddenly, the ANC is ready. I mean, the country is <laughs> ready for, for a woman president. So women are not only important in terms of the numbers they bring. It is their transformational leadership that really matters. You can be few women, but if the thrust of your leadership in an organization, whether you are alone or with just a few of you, is transformational, you can have much more impact than a situation as we see it now in South Africa, where we've got a parliament that sings the praises of a man who has stolen my money and built a palace for himself. The people who are doing the defending are the women. You know, there's so many things I admire about South Africa. I mean, really, the narrative of, of liberation. And um, yes, there's violence for sure, but really when you consider the pathway, one of the most remarkable uh, narratives of certainly our lifetime. And one of the things that I've also deeply admired, and some countries have done it, some have not, is the degree to which it has come to grapple with its past. And I'm thinking of the restorative justice, that whole system. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's really quite remarkable. Well, I think the contribution that Mandela made to South Africa was really to drive that agenda of reconciliation, of facing up to them. And the reason you could do it is that he took the 27 years of loneliness, of frustration, 
as a time for personal growth. The Mandela who went to jail is not the Mandela who came out. And that is important because when you have transformational leaders don't become transformational because they're dealing with this rule or that, it starts inside. And so you can then lead with conviction from your own personal journey. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was established in the mid-90s, was an opportunity for South Africans to acknowledge the wounds and to give those who were the perpetrators of gross violations of human rights to ask for forgiveness and to ask to give the victims the opportunity to actually get their grief addressed. I believe that it was an important step towards our healing. I also have to say to you that I lost the battle of trying to add to that gross violation of human rights a window for socioeconomic violation of rights, the, the, the violation of socioeconomic rights. Because what's happened now, as I described, with these very wealthy white business people, they've just, many of them said, well, yeah, mea culpa, mea culpa, and off they go, it costs them zero. And they are wealthy, they are living happily ever after. The women, and there are 77,000 of them, who were active in that healing process of They've lost their, wife, their, their husbands, their sons, their daughters, their relatives, are still waiting. Even the reparations which were voted by parliament have yet to be distributed to these women. So there's been a kind of adding salt to the wounds of South Africans who were generous with their forgiveness but did not actually get to meet the just uh, returns, at least in terms of restoration of their dignity. And so the difficulty we now face in South Africa is that the gap between rich and poor is growing, and the anger about the perpetuation of poverty and the unemployment and the larger segment of the population that's unemployed are young people. In rural areas, it's up to 70% of all young people. Because with a poor education system, a corrupted uh, skills development program, young people are really left hanging. And so the violence that scares me more than anything else is the brutal, intimate violence, domestic violence, partner violence, I mean, femicide, we are the world's uh, champion in women who are killed by their intimate partners. And these are sequelae of the wounds that have not been addressed. Those men who were living on a little bed and now they are retired, they are useless, quote unquote, and what do they do? They want to assert themselves and the only language powerless people have is violence. I know, given the range of topics, I know we'll go to many different places, but I have to ask from one vice chancellor to another yes. about higher education. And in particular, um, how in, in the multiple stages since the, the end of apartheid, but how has higher education evolved and is it beginning to offer a broader sector of, of the young people opportunities for um, upward mobility? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that obviously all the universities are now accessible theoretically to everybody. But no, because if you mess up the education system at the school's level, you limit access to universities. I mean, the University of Cape Town, which is my university that I really, even today, I still feel I left part of my heart there. I was checking the other day, 
uh, and looking at their statistics. Black African students are still a minority. It's shocking stuff. And it's not because anybody is standing there at the gate and saying, don't come in. They just don't have the level of grades at the high school level to get in. And those that scrape through into the system don't make it. Only 30% of our students graduate in record time because this, the education system is not one adequate to the task of the 21st century. And that is, I believe, I'm going to use a very strong term, is genocide. <laughs> because it's not as if this failing education system is failing because we don't know what to do. One, we have the resources. There is an adequate bu budget which gets uh, pilfered. Second, the teachers, and you cannot raise the level of, and the, of the quality of education above the level of the quality of teaching. I say so because my parents, who were teachers, with very little, but because they were dedicated, they made us into who we are. Teachers in the majority of poor schools, that's in 80% of the schools, are members of the South African Teachers Democratic Teachers Union, which is an, an affiliate of Kusatu, which is an ally of the ANC. So if you are going to rule until Jesus Christ comes, you've got to have all your troops there. So, they just are not interested in the business of teaching. They're interested in how they can position themselves within the ANC so they go to parliament and end up, as some of them have, in the cabinet of Mr. Zuma. So we are failing young people. And so if the school system is underperforming, clearly it will have an impact on the higher education. Having said that, my colleagues in the higher education system also have not risen to the challenge. There are still universities that are teaching without any thought as to how you can make sure that the programs that you've got in your university system actually help young people to understand who they are, where they come from, and how they are connected to the rest of the continent and modernity. And the issues of sexual harassment, uh, racism, and so on, they're there. You look at the profile of academics in South African universities, still predominantly white, still predominantly male, in 2015. Now, this is a problem which is going to be with us for a while, but it is not an insurmountable problem. So we have work to do in South Africa. And that is why I believe that the only way we can get traction is to get young people who are the ones who are bearing the brunt of what's going on, this poor governance and corruption. To be them, like in our case, we stood up and say, we are no longer non-wise, non-Europeans. We are black, we are proud, and you better watch out. And the young people today must say to us, the golden oldies, we <laughs> now are taking charge because you have failed and you are failing us. And we would like to have a society that lives up to the dreams that are captured in our constitution. So one last question before I open it up. And though I will say, since I'm the moderator, I reserve the right to insert questions later if I can't help myself. But one of the things that's both, <clears throat> I see mobilized both by forces of change here, especially young people, and sometimes people that I regard as, or movements I regard as resisting change, are new forms of media, social media. How is that playing out in South Africa? Big time. Uh, because even not so smartphones can really work. Um, I think that young people in South Africa have the means to communicate. What really is the impediment is this mindset problem. You know, people are so imprisoned 
by poor level education. So they lack the self-confidence to even initiate conversations around things that bother them. And when they do, it is around very mundane things mm -hmm. and uh, things that really don't build. But there is a really exciting development in the higher education sector where students have raised their voice and say, is this all? No, we need real freedom. So those are university students, students at technical, and they are using social media. They are communicating and spreading the momentum. So it started at UCT, it's at Wurz, it's at Stellenbosch, and Stellenbosch University never thought that anybody would be able to stand up and challenge the hegemony of Afrikaans, which is the language of modified Dutch, which is there. And these young people are not afraid. And they can communicate with someone at the University of Johannesburg and say, we have in this, and can you come down? And it's, it's really, it's coming. So what is important is they need to act as civic stewards and not destroy, right? The, the problem with the movements like Occupy or um, uh, even the um, Arab Spring is when it becomes destructive because that's your, what you are destroying are your assets. And so what is needed is my generation to not say, oh, what are these young people doing? To, but to encourage them and remind them that they are now the leaders they are waiting for. And therefore, they have to act in ways that are appropriate for civic owners of the democracy. We have um, a couple people with microphones. So um, how are we doing this? Is someone's going to suggest they will have a question? Oh, I see we are bringing, ah, there they are. Okay, I've got it. So please come up to um, a microphone if you would like to ask a question. Professor Ferguson. Lower that a bit. <laughs> um, that was a phenomenal talk and exchange between the two of you. And my question, there were so many moments when you were speaking that I was kind of getting the shivers about how relevant what you were saying was to the politics of our nation state at the moment. And my question for you uh, is really, what do you see as the possibility for international alliances in trying to deal with these problems that are it seems endemic to, well, they're all over, all over the world at the moment. And higher education is a sector that has traditionally been thought to be the place where people are not necessarily good nationalists or being trained up to be uh. civic servants who don't question. So I'm wondering, a part of it is just a, a practical question. What can your admirers in other countries, including this one, do as you see it for South Africa's struggle, if anything. Mm. Um, it may be not at the moment, though there was a period when international pressure clearly had a, had a major role. And if you do see a role for some kind of international ally, alliance based in higher education, what would it look like? I'm so pleased that you asked that question because we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people of the United States for the support for our struggle for freedom uh, from apartheid. And we also owe a great debt of gratitude to you for allowing the likes of me. I was a Banton scholar 27 years ago, and uh, I was also a fellow at Kennedy School, 
And of course, during my time here as a managing director of the World Bank, I established many friendships. I see in your report that you have had Dana Shalela here, who was the first person who invited me to come when she was still the president of Hunter College. And so I'm afraid we have not finished the job that you supported us to do. And we are coming back to say, can we find ways in which we can work together? First of all, you also are wrestling with the unfinished business of your social relationship. I mean, I'm shocked that young people can be killed like dogs in the street in the land of the free and the brave. Now, that is a wake-up call to you to say your job is not done either. So how can we have cross-Atlantic learnings? Because I think in both cases, identity politics has yet to be fully resolved so that we can claim that we are truly a non-racial and non-discriminatory and inclusive democracies. We are not, both of us. But I put my faith in young people. And that's why your point about higher education is relevant. One of the things I don't think we are doing systematically enough, uh, I know between the University of Cape Town and many other universities here that exchange programs, but they tend to be very haphazard and dealing only with the academic side. Why don't we use those cohorts of students who are going across the Atlantic either way as learning opportunities? So your young people coming to South Africa to not only have time to enjoy the beauty of Cape Town, but to also look at what are the relevant um, lessons they can learn from how we are wrestling and struggling and failing in our attempts to create a non-racial society. And the same thing with young people coming to your side of the Atlantic and the ac academic, uh, um, the members of the, of the academic staff. I think the second area where we really need to go back and explore, South Africa's or, or struggle for democracy was also supported by faith-based organizations here in this country. Like, uh, like you, we have plenty of churches. But, you know, I was lucky to be here when the Pope was here because the message of love, mercy, humility, and stewardship of the environment, that's message which we, as people of faith, are really not living. As he said, it's not useful to me to tell me how much you love your God. Let me see it in the way in which you conduct yourself as a citizen, as a leader, as a mother, as a father. And so, so can we use all that platform as well? And finally, I really believe that uh, there are very important linkages. I am going to Oakland tomorrow and one of the things I'm doing is to build networks of support here in the United States. There is a program being run by Friends of Friends, which is looking at cities in this country. Because in the 21st century, as you said, people are connected. And the cities are really the new nodes, the new, so we're going back to city states, as it were. And yet, Every city in both your country and mine, the marginalized people are the majority people. Stuck away somewhere in Dorchester, in Boston, where I've just been, or in Cape Town, the most beautiful city in Africa. You arrive at the airport, hello, here we are, we don't do equality here. So can we find ways in which we have cross learnings and I know for sure that I'm going to follow up with some of the things that people are doing, which are very exciting in Boston, which I'm going to want to take home to uh, look at. Having said that, the value of the land is through the floor. So we are going to need financial support, both for the, these exchanges in the higher education system, 
but also for these learnings at community level. Because we've got to mobilize people, parents to take charge of the schools, citizens to take charge of the cities. It's not going to happen because some leader somewhere, heaven forbid, Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> is going to rescue us. We it's not going to happen. We have to be the ones who put people in positions of leadership knowing we will hold them to account. David. Yeah, so I want to ask you uh, actually a very specific question that relates to your original training as a medical doctor, and that's uh, the, about the HIV epidemic. Um, I think it first became clear to me, someone who's visited South Africa a number of times, that something was really wrong with the ANC when I saw their reaction under Thabo Mbeki to, uh, to the epidemic. And I'm wondering if you could um, Tell us more about how, how that's gone. Is there any improvement in that direction? Uh, what are the challenges that are left? You know, if you were to pick a, an epidemic that would really uh, trip South Africa's progress to democracy, that is the one. Because it presses all the wrong buttons. First, it's a sexually transmitted disease. We don't talk sex, we just do it. <laughs> It's, South Africa is a very conservative society, so that was a big thing. Second, the majority of people inevitably were black people with. So again, the stereotype of the promiscuous black person. And third, the ANC and other liberation movement, but the ANC was the majority of people who were in exile, came back carrying the disease. Now, these are liberators. How dare you say that they're bringing this deadly disease with them? So we had a big unspoken trauma, going back to that multiply traumatized society. So Tabombeki decided to shut down this discussion. It must not happen. And so, Mandela, who was at the time really like a president and Mbeki was a prime minister, did not pay enough attention to it. But when it hit his own son, it gave him the opportunity. It was a horrible thing to say, but he seized that opportunity and said publicly, my son died of AIDS. So the taboo, the silence was thrown out of the door. What's happened since, thanks again to the international community, is that obviously during that time of denialism, it, we relied on the outside world to support people to get even the basics. I mean, countless people, millions of people died in South Africa because of it. And as a result, part of these problems of underage moms, these are girls who had to, to look after their siblings because they were all orphaned. And so the impact of HIV AIDS in South Africa is really devastating. The social fabric has been torn and it's difficult to knit it together. And we could have, if we had a good healthcare system, a good education system, and a social welfare program, which was a proper safety net and not a um, an election machinery. And so right now, we have HIV at a level where it's somewhere in just below the, in the overall below 10, but in terms of pockets, the young women between 15 and 35, we're looking at 30 something percent uh, prevalence rate. I mean, it's, horrific stuff. And so we still have a big problem of HIV AIDS. Yes, now there's uh, free treatment all over, but to get to a clinic that works where the drugs are there every day is a problem. Of course, if you are me, 
you will be able to go to a private hospital or to get to a clinic that works in the suburban areas. And so again, HIV AIDS follows the same pattern of those who are marginal, not only have a higher infection rate, but they get the least quality treatment. Why don't we alternate microphones? I know there are people ready to come up to each one. Hello, uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I am one of those young people you're speaking of. And in this country as well, um, we belong, I belong to the generation that, like the largest generation to not vote, um, or to participate in civics or civic life or politics in any form. But what I have seen is that um, this is in large part because of a total disillusionment, a legitimate rational disillusionment with traditional political processes, which are even academically verified and uh, economically verified as non-democratic. And so what we've seen in student activism, both here and globally, is a um, uh, circum circumventing these traditional civic routes towards routes of civil disobedience, towards routes of direct action. We see this in Mexico and Chile. We see it on this campus and we see it in this um, university system. So when you're speaking of civic engagement among South African youth, um, is when you, when you imagine that, is it something that inhabits both traditional and non-traditional um, methods of intervention, both say, um, what we'd say civil versus civil disobedience and um, that sort of theater uh -huh. of direct action? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate to have networks of young people that I work with, uh, some uh, in the poorest townships who completely lost hope. And we have a uh, grassroots arts academy that we started in Kailisha. Again, going back to the question of money, we can use some money. These are young people who went to an arts high school. 84%, I mean 84, numerical 84, passed, got their metric certificate. Only four could make it into UCT. 80 in the streets. Now, you, you can imagine what's going to happen after a few months of frustration. So we obviously can't cater for all 80, but we took those who were really persistent and willing to, to go through that. So we've got an, a real startup academy of about 15 young people. What matters is not whether they vote now. They will ultimately vote if they feel like. But what shocked me is how little they knew about what does it mean to be a citizen? What are their rights? What are their responsibilities? And their parents, in the face of them being just dumped there, just don't know what do they do. But imagine if those 84 parents were to come together and go to the Department of Education, what do you think we should do with these young people? Now that's the kind of activism I'm talking about. Uh, and, uh, but now that we have started this little thing, and we've, it's amazing, because some of the parents were saying, in any case, dancing is not a job go and find a decent job. Now they come to the shows, they see these young people dancing the kind of narratives of freedom and of being and, and so on. So that's one example. The other is there is a friend who started a, a school and then linked it to other schools that are called extraordinary schools in South Africa. This is affordable excellence for poor kids. These are schools that operate and they get 100% pass rates and all their young people who go to university, 85% of them are, are, have graduated now. And what's happening? They are volunteering to teach in those same schools where they came from. So these kind of young people, I spend a lot of time with them because it's very discouraging because even those who are on the staff don't get enough pay, and so do they quit? And if they quit, what are the implications for these models of change that are happening? But I think 
there is also a level of engagement that I'm talking about, which is if you grow up in a South Africa where you can't even talk about HIV AIDS, there is a toxic masculinity. You are a man. How do you define what it means to be? You are born and bred in a family where only your mother shows up. You don't even know where your father is if he's around. Or he's around and very violent and brutal. How do you become a man? Who, where's your role model? So we have circles where we talk about those things. Because I don't believe that we can afford the kind of feminism which talks about strengthening young women and forget about their men. I mean, I also am biased because I've got two sons. Um, but the reality is helping young people to f define what it means to be a man and a woman in a, the South Africa of today is also part of civic activism. And getting the gogos and the old, the grandfathers to be part of those conversations is really what I'm devoting a lot of my time doing. Um, so I think we underestimate what is possible. Here at UC Davis, imagine if you as young people, and that's what I liked about the breakfast I had this morning with young people from cultural studies, atmospheric science and uh, ecology, et cetera, and anthropology. This cross-disciplinary pollination is so important. But going beyond just doing it when you have a guest, how, how much do you do it on campus to talk about the things that really you have, you have just raised now? Instead of waiting for a crisis, when you are really angry, then of course, it's, it's not a good time to talk. So I, I really believe that young people have to take advantage of the space, particularly the space in higher education, which is what we did, to say, hey, we are it. We are the leaders who must take this country to a different place. I think there was someone, yes, yes, please. Thank you so much for this talk. So I was really struck by your use of this idea of narrative and the power of these narratives and then your frankness about failure. And I wanted to pivot and kind of ask you about the possibilities for new narratives. So if you had to imagine what kinds of new narratives would be useful for this younger generation that you're sort of calling to to um, take up this project, uh, if you were imagining that narrative, what are one or two things that you could say that you got right mm -hmm. and that the ANC got right so that as they were moving forward, they had a sense of the history that they were coming out of as they were imagining, well, what new and better things do we need to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I th I'm encouraged that even without my intervention, those new narratives are coming out. There is a 17-year-old young woman who said something to this effect, that we as women are forging new ways of talking about who we are and where we're coming from. And she then says, I now know that when people say that I am threatening, it's because I am threatening. Because we women, this is 17 year old, we women no longer know our place. So the very act of being free as a young woman to talk. I don't know whether you've uh, ever looked at uh, Albert Camus' statement about how do you become free in an unfree world? And he says the only way to be free in an unfree world is to be so outrageously free that the very act of freedom is rebellion, okay? This is what I'm seeing with these young people. So when we meet and talk, we don't talk what the NC is doing or not doing. No, we don't have time for that. <laughs> I, I'm doing it here because I was asked to do it. We, what we do is to talk about what is their sense of the kind of South Africa they would like to see 
and what is their role in it. A lot of them wrestle with their own self-image, their own self-concept. We've gone back to horrible names like beauty and Christmas and stuff like that. So they have to deal with that because you can't be a transformational leader if you haven't figured out that, in fact, it's not your fault that you were called Christmas. Uh, but then I ask, what, do you, what can you do about it? You can, in fact, go to home affairs and, and rename yourself. But I don't even know that. These are university graduates. Okay? So we deal with these things in order for them to be comfortable. Because I believe that young people really wrestle with so much. Imagine growing up in a family where, which is broken, dysfunctional, and you make it to university against all odds, and you end up in a job where you are treated with disrespect. I mean, when does it, where does it end? And that's why I believe that what is needed of my generation is to be the bridge between the old way of being South Africans and the new way that they, the young people, must help articulate and shape. But there is, they are going to meet up with a lot of pain, a lot of um, trauma that we, the generation that's been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, have to be there to accompany them. And so I have no doubt about the narrative story. There's also uh, another young woman who said, the only way we will be able to transform our society is to do what she says her mother and her grandmothers used to do, which is to tell beautiful stories. Beautiful stories about ourselves and about our mothers, our grandmothers, and to be filled with the love of that beauty. Because when that happens, you don't go out there looking for love. There is so much of a well inside. So my engagement with young people is not to judge them but to help them see this beauty inside, to tap into this well inside them. And it can be pretty empty when you are bashed left, right, and center. But we've got to keep the hope that there is, in fact, a way in which the country that we dream about can be a reality. But it's got to start where you are. If you're a doctor, the way you become a doctor and you relate to people has to model that. If you're a lawyer, if you're a dancer, if whatever you do. And so I think the new narratives are not going to emerge from me. They're going to emerge from these young people, and they are emerging. If you go into my website, you'll see some of the things I say about that. I think there's another question over here. Dr. Ramfele. Uh, what a pleasure and honor it is to uh, receive your wisdom and be in your presence. Um, I have a question about social media and what your perspectives are uh, regarding uh, social media as it relates to um, activism of today's youth. And let me just kind of back up a little bit and say that, you know, I, I was in a recent social media conversation and, and one of the uh, recurring uh, uh, comments or, or themes that came up is that, you know, social media is a comfortable way to protest or to um, push towards action. Um, and, because it's 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 comfortable, a lot of times the action or the results that we would like to see you know happen don't happen. Um, 
And so I'd, I'd like to hear about your perspectives about uh, how um, social media uh, either helps or, or hurts uh, in this direction towards a new uh, South Africa. Oh my God, my cell phone came on at the most okay. opportune time. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I, 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 I really believe that um, social media, like any tool, can be a, a, a positive or a negative tool. It's, it's, it's a facility that we are blessed to have in the 21st century. And the way I have seen young people use social media positively is when they have a network that starts on whatever program it is, that, whether they are graduate students focusing on a particular project or professional young people, young women who just want to have a network of support because it's really tough out there in the uh, working environment. And then the media, the social media platform becomes a place where people, we have in South Africa, I don't know whether you have it here, called WhatsApp. Yep. So I can WhatsApp so and so and say, you know, I'm feeling down and this and this happened to me. And they say, oh, never mind. Just look at the moon. We've got a super moon today or whatever. Okay. <laughs> but it, social media platforms can also be toxic. They can demean. They, I mean, I don't know whether many of you know about Lindwe Mazibuko, who was the leader of the DA in parliament. She's now at the Kennedy School. I mean, people used to attack her because they couldn't attack her in parliament because she's a formidable debater. So then they go and abuse her personally on the media. And it is that kind of negative side of it. But as a platform, I really think that if we harness the positive side, but we've got to define its use. Because I also don't want to have a thousand emails a day. But if we can find a way of using the media as an appropriate way of networking, of checking in, of tracking, then I think we have a, a positive story. But going back to the issue of identity politics, I really think men need to talk to other men about what it means to be a man. Because women uh, find it much easier to communicate. That's how we have been brought up. Men bottle up, and the next thing you know, in South Africa these days, policemen shoot their families and then shoot themselves. I mean, if only that person, instead of doing that, were to call a friend on the WhatsApp and say, you know, I'm feeling like death and so on. It's, we, we have to harness the positive side of it. But I also think the media, we need to accept the fact that People who had no access to information, today they have. And these are poor kids, even in the back of beyond. They can be able to uh, connect with what's going on in the world. And in my village in Limpopo, uh, a young man who's a, a successful businessman has also set up a computer lab in that village school, and suddenly these young people can do homework, can do this, can do, which, I mean, they were doing homework. Now they don't have to be looking for non-existent books. They now can actually get into the web. And so, so I'm a great believer in, in the power of the media. Uh, I think like everything else, we've got to harness its positive side, but then help young people to negotiate the dangers of getting into those sites where people really get uh, into trouble. One of the nice things about the Chances Colloquium, we'll also be able to carry on in a conversation at a reception, but we have one last question for, for this space. Hello. Um, good evening, Dr. Hi, beloved. How are you? Good. Miss you. So I want to, to ask a question that I think we, are, well, we could both talk about, but I particularly want you to address this audience on. Mm -hmm. um, we both worked very hard to transform the University of Cape Town in our mm -hmm. different capacities. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the chance to revisit earlier this year and, of course, was delighted to see the Roads Must Fall uh, movement because it really felt as if they were picking up something that 
in our different capacities, you and I had tried to start uh, yeah. 15 years ago, yeah. I think about, um, from 99 onwards. So what I, we both worked at very different levels and in different ways. I dealt with curriculum and research, and you were at the top. Um, but what I'd like to invite you to share, because there's a major diversity project going on on this campus, uh -huh. I'd like you to, I mean, one of the major differences, because you see the, the population here, but here we are talking about a minority. And when I moved here from Cape Town, the statistics don't look that different, but in South Africa, I think it was that much more painful for me as a West African yeah. to know that here we were dealing with majority yeah. exclusion. So I want to make that difference before yeah. we presume there's any quick link between yeah. the US, yeah. which, you know, 500 years, I'm not sure that mm -hmm. with a minority, I'm not sure that South Africa can learn from the US because it has clearly failed to deracialize even with a black president. Yeah. So, so my question for you is really about some of the mistakes we made. Um, we were both up against a very intractable system. What do you take away from that, and how might we better transform university, the modern university, yeah. um, at this time? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Mama and I had this amazing opportunity to start the African Gender Institute at the University of Cape Town. Uh, and for me, it's one of those projects which embody your dreams. Uh, and I left Cape Town confident that we are now in a position where we're going to have, give the women who come there a room of their own so they can really write their stories. Unfortunately, and I have to say, again, it's probably, I have to take some responsibility for this, that I should have stayed for one more term as a vice chancellor to consolidate the, trans, the, the changes that had happened. Because my successors came in, UCT was 200 kilometers ahead of the rest of the pack, and they just, Chilled, as they say, the young <laughs> people say. And so nothing much was done. If anything, some of the things were undermined, like the African Gender Institute and um, the numbers of African students, the growing our own timber program, which was about, you can't wait for young women and young men and black people to become professors. You've got to accelerate that process by a deliberate investment program, and we called it Growing Our Own Timber. And it was a fabulous program because it was supported by uh, charitable organizations from here in the US, but also the UK and in the private sector because it made so much sense that instead of letting young black people who would otherwise have uh, followed a PhD and then postdoc and so have to go and work to support their families. Now, why not support them with a higher stipend so they stay in and then you have this um, pipeline of young men and women coming through. And the Gender Institute was precisely to be the space where we talk about these toxic masculinities, the positive masculinities that are emerging, and of course, what how do we embed the feminine values which are there in the saying of Ubuntu, I am because you are. That's what, that Ubuntu is all about, those feminine um, attributes. So it's not as if you want to turn the world into women. We just want to bring the feminine, which all of us have, into the spaces to detoxify them and make them much more able to support all of us, men and women, to be the best that we can become. So I believe that the, uh, the University of Cape Town relaxed after 2000, and they are paying the price, and I'm very pleased with the Rose Must Fall movement. Because then I went and looked at the statistics. I was shocked to find that black African students are still a minority. Of course, the school system is not working, but what stops the University of Cape Town to take the growing our own timber to the schools in Cape Town to say, <coughs> we are going to partner with 
X number of schools in each township so that we can help them to produce the high quality graduate so they can be able to compete for places at UCT. <coughs> I think they now have a second ch chance. Uh, I'm not so sure that we have transformational leadership at the top of UCT today. And so the university community, and I'm an alumni, I'm an alumnus who has refused to get engaged because that is talking or ruling from the grave. Uh, but I would hope that other alumni will come forward and say, hey, this ain't working. We've got to actually find the kind of leadership that can take us to the next step. That's what's needed. And it can be done and it would work because the infrastructure is there at UCT. The goodwill is there. The problem is leadership. Would you join me in thanking our guests for a remarkable, remarkable time? Thank you.